A reading from the first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Brothers and sisters, the Spirit scrutinizes everything, even the depths of God. Among men, who knows what pertains to the man, except the Spirit that is within? Similarly, no one knows what pertains to God except the Spirit of God. We have not received the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, so that we may understand the things freely given us by God. And we speak about them not with words taught by human wisdom, but with words taught by the Spirit, describing spiritual realities in spiritual terms. Now the natural man does not accept what pertains to the Spirit of God, for to him it is foolishness, and he cannot understand it, because it is judged spiritually. The one who is spiritual, however, can judge everything, but is not subject to judgment by anyone. For who has known the mind of the Lord so as to counsel him? But we have the mind of Christ. The Lord is just in all his ways. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness. The Lord is good to all and compassionate toward all his works. Let all your works give you thanks, O Lord, and let your faithful ones bless you. Let them discourse of the glory of your kingdom and speak of your might. The Lord is just in all his grace. Making known to men your might and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is a kingdom for all ages, and your dominion endures through all generations. The Lord is just in all the Lord is faithful in all his words and holy in all his works. The Lord lifts up all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. Vobiscum Lectio Sancti Evangelii Secundum Lucam Jesus went down to Capernaum, a town of Galilee. He taught them on the Sabbath, and they were astonished at his teaching because he spoke with authority. In the synagogue, there was a man with the spirit of an unclean demon, and he cried out in a loud voice, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Jesus rebuked him and said, be quiet, come out of him. Then the demon threw the man down in front of them and came out of him without doing him any harm. They were all amazed and said to one another, what is there about his word? For with authority and power, he commands the unclean spirits and they come out and news of him 
spread everywhere in the surrounding region. Verbum Domini. Today's section from the first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians, chapter 2, deals with an extremely important part of the life of our faith. He is dealing with, in one sense, a teaching that Christ our Lord had given in St. John's Gospel, especially in chapters 14 through 16. In there, our Lord promised the apostles two things. One, I must leave. I will depart, but two, I will not leave you orphans, but I will give you the spirit of truth. And he goes on to explain something very important underlying Paul's teaching today. Namely that everything that Jesus has comes from the Father and he gives it all to the Spirit. That this is very important for our understanding of why we teach the doctrine of the Blessed Trinity. That in the Trinity and its inner life each person is constantly giving his whole self to the other persons. This whole self-giving that the Father gives whatever he has to the Son, but the Son doesn't cling to it, he lets go and gives it back. And that the Holy Spirit understands this, he receives everything as well. And when, when we say everything, it's not like an inheritance that we might give to our children. Say, I'll give everything to this child or something. With everything, we mean that God gives all that exists, all knowledge that is beyond even the universe. Everything that is infinite, most especially their love. And that is constantly poured out. Then we can understand, in light of that, what St. Paul is saying here. Because of that mutual self-giving, it is possible for the Spirit, therefore, to know everything of God. He alone understands everything of God. And we don't. But the good news is that Jesus Christ promised to give us that same Holy Spirit. And that this Holy Spirit would lead us into all truth, as Jesus our Lord says. And with that promise that the Holy Spirit would be the one to give us truth, we go forward. Now, something that's very important also we should keep in mind just so we don't get too carried away with ourselves. The Holy Spirit has infinite truth. We have finite minds. So we will grasp what our small minds are capable of grasping. We don't comprehend infinity. We don't get everything that God has to offer. That's very important so that we keep ourselves in perspective. And that we therefore keep the mysteries of God in perspective. Because these mysteries of God are also infinite. And we will get 
as much as we can of them. Just like a little child will get as much as he or she can about the universe, but it's going to be pretty limited. And even the physicists are always learning more, no matter how ingenious they are. They keep learning bits. And that's just the universe. When we are dealing with the mysteries of God, we are dealing with mysteries that are beyond even the power of the universe. So just keep ourselves and our small minds in that kind of perspective. That's a good thing. But at the same time that we keep ourselves in perspective, St. Paul is dealing with a situation of a new Christian community living in a city that was infamous for its sin. In his day, calling somebody a Corinthian meant that they were a lustful person. That was part of the fame. And to deal with these new Christians, he is also dealing with the fact that the Holy Spirit is leading them into all truth. St. Paul has revealed much to them, but they still had a lot more to learn about the sacred scriptures about the life of Christ, about the meaning of the faith. In fact, this first letter to the Corinthians is the third book of the New Testament to actually be written down. St. Paul had written First and Second Thessalonians, and now this is the third book, even before the Gospels are written. The Gospels had been commended to memory and passed on in the oral tradition. But by this point, they, in the early 50s, they probably were still not yet written. So there's much more to learn, to be sure. And the problem for these Christians living in a very lustful world that had its own ability to say, look, not unlike our world, you do what you want so long as you pay for it and don't hurt anybody or hurt anybody too badly. And whatever you want to do goes. And there was all manner of different kinds of sexual vice that Corinth was known for. It was kind of a double port city that what would happen is ships would come either from the west or the east to the small isthmus of Corinth. And the ships would be taken out of the water, put on rollers, and rolled across the isthmus by certain professionals. Okay? And that meant the sailors had nothing to do in between getting in and out of the sea. So they found something to do, and there were pr plenty of professionals to help them find something to do. Usually the kind of thing that you'll do in a foreign place where nobody knows your name. That's what they were interested in, and the locals made a lot of money off of that kind of sin. Thinking that the sin was anonymous, and that therefore nobody will know what I'm up to, and I can get away with it. And in a culture where people think they can get away with just about anything, St. Paul is saying that you have received the Spirit of God. And he is going to be the one who helps you discern what is God's own way of doing things. What is God's norm for right and wrong, for truth and falsehood? And that he is going to correct the bad behavior that they took 
for granted. It was their custom. It was the way of their local society, a society that was looser even than most of the other cities of the Mediterranean. And that this will be judged so that the natural man won't understand you. The man, and as a matter of fact, but this translation uses natural man, it's the man of flesh. The man of the flesh will not be able to understand you because the man of flesh does not receive the Spirit of God. And therefore, he only discerns things by the flesh. The assumptions of natural personality, the assumptions of natural culture and society, those are what we take for granted. And these are going to be judged by us as right and wrong. It will seem to the people of flesh to be close-minded, to judge things that are called sinful by God, seems close-minded, and one of the worst things you can do in certain cultures, including our own, is to say, you are being judgmental. But that is exactly what the Holy Spirit gives us, is the ability to judge what is right and wrong. Now, what when Christ our Lord does clearly and strongly and forthrightly say, judge not, lest you be judged by the same standard, he is referring to our inability with these small minds that we have to judge whether somebody is condemned by God or not. We can't say somebody is going to hell or not. And the church, through the centuries, has been very careful not to say who's in hell. The church will discern the saints who are in heaven by the favors that God works with them, but we don't have a similar list of the people in hell. That's not our ability to understand or judge. But what we can discern is the behavior that the Holy Spirit reveals through Scripture and the kinds of teachings that Christ gives us in the Gospels as to what is hellish behavior. We cannot say an individual is in hell, but we can say this behavior is what the Lord has said will take you to hell. And the more spiritual within the church Various great saints and theologians who not only had good intellect, but also were deep people of the Spirit, so that they understood not only the externals of what God forbade or required, but the more they understand and meditate and are led by the Holy Spirit, the more deeply they understand the wisdom of what God says. Now, in our society, we have many, many challenges to what is the wisdom that the Holy Spirit reveals on lots of levels. There is a growing antagonism toward the church of God. There is a growing fear that they, in fact, oftentimes are much more willing in our society to attack Christians for their moral stances and attack the Christian church, in particular the Catholic church, for its moral stance, then they are willing to call 
Islamist terrorists, Islamists. They're more afraid of us, oftentimes, than they are of the Islamists. So that they won't call an act of terror what it is. Like the use of man-made disaster instead of Islamist terrorist, terrorism when that occurs. But they're doing that oftentimes out of a fear, out of that natural man's inability to understand what the Holy Spirit is saying in the church about what is right and wrong. And they fear more what we have to say about matrimony being between a man and a woman, about the inherent necessity of protecting life from conception through natural death. They fear that. They fear what we have to say about drunkenness and the use of drugs. And they want to make that acceptable. They fear all sorts of things that we have to say about what is required in terms of the justice done by people who own businesses and the people who work within them. So that justice is something mutual between owners and workers. And that they don't just get away with whatever they can, but they have to act according to principles of right and wrong, whether they own companies or work for companies. And this kind of critique is something that many people who are of the flesh will not want, yet alone be able to understand when we speak about the things of who God is, who Jesus Christ is. If you think they have resistance to what we have to say about morality, then what we say about the sacraments and the role of the Holy Spirit who animates the church, this is way beyond them. Our task is going to be one in which we seek to deepen our own prayer life so that we have a deeper relationship with this Holy Spirit so that we understand more of the things of God when it comes to morals and doctrine. And that we don't see, oh, maybe we should compromise with the people of flesh. This is something that we may not do. We must seek the wisdom that the Holy Spirit reveals and live by that. We will judge that wisdom by what's revealed in Scripture, in the sacred tradition, and the magisterium of the church. But we will also seek to go ever more profoundly into these truths so that we will be a counter-witness, as St. Paul called the Corinthians to do in their own society.